welcome your host, Dennis Horvitz, the David Letterman of the Hopelessly Damned. Uh, tonight we want to ask the question, what is the deep, dark secret behind the lure of religion? Ken, we should cue in the spooky music at this point. You know. <laughs> to help us answer that question, we have invited Dr. Darrell W. Ray. Dr. Ray grew up in Wichita, Kansas, which is, as you may know, the heart of the Bible Belt. He is the grandson of a country preacher and the child of Christian uh, missionaries. Uh, he expected to go into uh, the ministry himself, uh, but a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. That would make an interesting title for a play. <laughs> Think about it later. Um, he was, uh, as he was earning his master's degree in religion, he lost his faith, which is something that uh, happens uh, apparently not infrequently. Um, he changed his field instead to and got a, a doctorate in clinical psychology uh, from Vanderbilt University, and he is now uh, a practicing uh, psychologist specializing in organizational uh, psychology, coaching, uh, and counseling executives. He's here tonight to discuss, among, amongst other things, his book, uh, The God Bible. Virus, How Religion Infects Our Lives and Culture, which should be appearing on the screen behind me. And uh, he basically starts with uh, Dawkins' uh, premise of the cultural meme, and he explores uh, how religion uh, spreads as a virus would spread. Um, and I believe, if I recall from having read the book, um, that uh, we're, we're all more or less inadvertently uh, vectors in spreading this virus, even atheists, uh, kind of unwittingly because we use the language of religion and uh, just generally assume uh, uh, unwittingly kind of religious positions in certain uh, situations. Uh, he explores uh, the emotional manipulation behind uh, uh, the spread of religion and, and why religious fundamentalism is so difficult uh, to combat, but he does offer uh, many suggestions as to uh, how we can go about doing this. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> we're here to understand the love of Jesus and what he's done in sacrificing himself on the cross for us today. And if you can't feel that love, then you're not reaching deep enough, folks. You have to learn how to love Jesus the way He loved you. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Amen. That's the way it works. I want you to listen carefully to what I have to say today. I want you to understand how Jesus works in our lives. How mysteriously the Holy Spirit moves carefully and quietly through our lives to slowly but surely mold us so we can be fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven. The offering will be taken right now and we can all leave. <laughs> well, I want to give you a little sample of behavior because that's what we're going to look at. We're going to think about and talk about today is the behavior that, that creates religion, that religion creates. I'm going to go through some of these and we'll come back and we'll kind of look at this behavior and say, well, what, what, how did that work? And why do ministers preach that way? You've all seen that kind of preaching before. Well, of course... Protestants do that. Catholics don't. Am I correct? Well, Catholics do it, but they have their own way of doing it. So different groups have their, have their own techniques. And what we're going to learn is the techniques are quite similar across all religions, whether it's a Muslim, a, a Christian. It, it can be a Scientologist, probably. They have this, I haven't been to a Scientologist meeting, but I, I would predict that. So we're going to look and we're going to explore the viral metaphor that Dennis already mentioned. We're going to discuss infection strategies. How do people get infected with religion? And what's the strategy? We're going to look a little bit at <coughs> the language of religious leaders and kind of put the language on its head to try and analyze it. We're going to identify the guilt cycle and the survivor syndrome. We won't talk too much about that today, but I'll just touch on that. And we're going to talk about why does sexual control play such a big part in most religions? You ever thought about that? You, you almost can't name a religion. Now, you know, the pagans and the Wiccas, they seem to be pretty sexually open, but the rest of them are pretty sexually closed. And uh, we're going to, time permitting, we're going to look at how does the infection continue to affect us, even though we've thrown off religion, supposedly. To begin with, uh, wow, why is that not showing up there? It's because my water's in the way. All right. 
As Dennis said, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. I went through a master's degree. At the end of it, I said, I can't tell other people what to believe when I don't believe it myself. So I started moving out, got into my doctoral studies, and the interesting thing was, I started learning more and more about religion from a psychological, anthropological, and sociological perspective. And I started asking myself, why does religion behave the way it does? I couldn't find any answers in any of those three disciplines. They didn't seem to answer the question very well. Until one day I came across the selfish gene that Marty's reading right now. Hold it up, Marty. Recommended reading for anybody who's in our, in our field of atheism. <coughs> and it all came together when he started talking about memes and memetics. A few years later, I read his other, his other essay called uh, Viruses of the Mind. You can find it online. He published it in 1989. Really excellent essay, Viruses of the Mind. I'd recommend you go look it up and read it. It's a good supplement to what I'm, I'm going to be talking about tonight and what I write about in the book. So, what we're going to do today, we're just going to look under the hood. If you think about Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, how many of you have read all those? <coughs> okay, gosh, good, good. They all do a great job of telling what color the car is and what the upholstery looks like and whether it's got a steering wheel or not. What they don't say is, is it an internal combustion engine? Is it an electric engine? How does it work under the hood? So we're going to look under the hood. And once you look under the hood of a Chevy, it looks a whole lot like a Volkswagen. They're both internal combustion. They both have pistons. You look under the hood of a Christian, it looks a whole lot like a Muslim. They both act and interact in the same way. The techniques and the technology that these religions use to infect people is very similar. We're going to talk about the God virus and how that, as we look under the hood, how does this virus metaphor work? When I came across the viral metaphor of uh, reading Dawkins, it like, was like a flashlight in the dark. All of a sudden, I had something that could explain a wide variety of behaviors and explain why religion behaves in certain ways and doesn't behave in other ways. It was, it was a tremendous power to explain. So that, that kind of led me to ask the question, things like, things that formerly didn't make any sense to me, like, why do ministers use hypnotic techniques in religious services? Now, if you don't go to church services too often, you may not notice, or if you've never been trained in hypnosis, you may not notice. But they're using hypnotic techniques all the time. The ministers, the priests, the imams, they're all using them. And as you noticed, when I started preaching earlier, I preached in a certain cadence. And what I said made no sense whatsoever. It was pretty much stupid mumble jumble, but I preached just as well as most of those other evangelicals. I think did a good job, don't you think? Yes, hey, just say amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> All right. So what the second question I wanted to ask in the book is what makes people oblivious? to the shortcomings of their religion, but they can see all the shortcomings of other religions. Why, why can they see it so plainly? Other people, but not their own. So the purpose of the God virus is to uh, suggest a comprehensive method of explaining and understanding religion and to show how it can lead to a practical actions on the part of non-theists like ourselves and spiritual people. I don't care if you believe in God or not. I just want you to be aware of what religion is doing. And, uh, and, and how it affects our society. Now here's a little tip for you. If you don't leave with anything today, I want you to remember this one. Logic is not the answer. Would you raise your hand if you have argued somebody out of their religion? <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> you don't argue people out of religion. Logic is not the answer. There must be something else there. And we've all been frustrated. Can't, how can you believe in a virgin birth? How can you believe that Muhammad rode to heaven on a horse? I mean, it just makes no sense to us. But you can't argue them out of that. So there must be something else going on there. And that's a big part of what I explore in the book. We're going to also try to understand the channels of infection. And I'll, I'll explore several channels, not all of them. Kurt Lewin, the famous social psychologist, said this many years ago. There's nothing as practical as a good theory. And that's what I think the viral metaphor does. It gives us a good theory that has practical application for us. I spend the last four chapters of the book saying, how do we now apply all that we've talked about in the first half of the book to
to your life, to how you deal with your mother-in-law, who's a fanatic, you know, or your, or your sister that won't leave you alone. To understand that, we have to understand a little bit of biology, and I won't bore you too much with bi biology, but uh, anybody heard of Toxoplasma Gandhi? One, one, okay, great. If you've read the, okay. Well, there was a great article sometime back in Scientific American about this. This Toxoplasma uh, Gandhi is, is, uh, takes over the brains of rats. It takes over the brains, shuts off their fear of cats, shuts off the fear of cat pheromones, so that the rat will go out and try to find a cat to kiss. Isn't that interesting? It's a parasite that gets in the brain of the rat, turns the brain's rat off, and then rats go around doing things they normally wouldn't do, like get in the way of cats. Now, why would a parasite do that to a, a rat's brain? You know the answer to that. The answer is that the parasite wants the cat to eat the rat. Because the parasite can only reproduce inside the gut of the rat. Can't reproduce inside of the gut of a dog or an owl. So it remains to be afraid of dogs and owls. But it's not afraid of cats. Isn't that interesting? There are a lot of parasites in the, in the natural world that affect the neurological systems of other animals. There's another one called the lancet fluke. And it, it gets inside the rat, uh, brain of an of a ant and tells the ant to go up on top of a grass, piece of grass, and wait for the cow to eat it. Because it reproduces inside the gut of a cow. So you can see here, our ant, who's been infected, is ready to be eaten by, by the next cow that comes along. All right. So parasites can change brain functioning. And there's a lot of them out there. Rabies. Rabies is another one that we're all pretty familiar with. So that's a, a list of a bunch of them. So how does that fit into the God virus? Well, computer viruses. How many of you have had a computer virus on your computer? All right. Computer viruses act similar to parasites, don't they? They take over your computer and make it start doing, behaving in ways that are beneficial to the virus, not to you and your computer. It takes over. It's a parasite, if you will. Well, so computer viruses look a whole lot like these kind of viruses, the, these kind of parasites I talked about, the Toxoplasma gondii. Now think about this. What's your brain? It's a computer. Is it possible to get a virus in this computer that has its best interest at heart, not yours? I think so. Look at a Catholic priest who's celibate. Is it in the interest biologically of a priest to remain celibate and not reproduce himself? I don't think so. There's something going on there. And it looks a whole lot like other kinds of viruses that you see in the natural world. Now, I'm oversimplifying this a bit, so if you're thinking, oh, Daryl, you're oversimplifying it, I'm quite aware that I am for, for purposes of time. I don't oversimplify it in the book, or at least I don't think I do. So, there is a human parasite Human beings have something similar. It enters through the ears at an early age. It germinates in the mind and causes the host to denigrate or destroy rival communities, whilst abnormally rapidly produ reproducing, thus permitting the parasite to breed and exit via the mouth and infect others. It is commonly known as religion. Sound familiar, doesn't it? All right. Here's my thesis. Religion is an infection of the mind. It has consequences for both cognitive and intelligence and perception. Those infected with religion tend to avoid or deny scientific explanations for their behavior in favor of supernatural explanations. So they say, God helped me through the death of my husband. I mean, how many of us have heard that? As, as non-theists, we would probably say, I have a lot of strength, I have a lot of friends, I know how to take care of myself and someone else. There's no reference to a supernatural, invisible friend anywhere. So there's quite a difference. What makes the theist deny their own involvement in, in their achievements, if you will? Jesus, I owe everything to Jesus. God gave me that touchdown. You know, that's, that's what they say, isn't it, after the touchdown in a lot of those schools. All right. 
So, strategy of infection. There's remarkable similarities between the way biological viruses infect people and the way um, God viruses infect people. And the infection strategies can be outlined in two ways. One is what I call a vertical infection strategy. And that's when the mother gives the virus to the child vertical through the generations. A mother with HIV AIDS could give AIDS to her child. That'd be a vertical infection strategy. And the parasite, in this case, the HIV virus, is propagating itself vertically. But that same virus can propagate itself horizontally too through sexual contact between her and other, other people. So there's a, a vertical infection strategy for HIV and there's a horizontal infection strategy for HIV. Voila, there's a vertical infection strategy for religion, there's a horizontal infection strategy for religion. And different religions use different strategies. For example, if you are a, if you're a Mormon, they got a big focus on which? Vertical or horizontal? Horizontal, right. They send those poor kids out knocking on doors. That's a horizontal infection strategy. Now, they do have a vertical one because they do pass it along to their children, but they put a lot of emphasis on that. Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of emphasis on horizontal strategy. If you're a Druze in Israel, Lebanon, Syria, in that area, if you belong to the Druze religion, they closed that religion in 1247. You couldn't become a Druze if you wanted to. And if you marry somebody outside the Druze, they just kick you out. It's closed. The only infection strategy that religion has is a vertical infection strategy. So you can see that religion can follow very similar infection strategies to biological organisms, whether they be a parasite or a virus. So when did you get religion? Most of us got when we were a little kid, didn't we? You usually get it when you're a little kid, when your resistance is low. That's, that's the key. Get them while they're young. That's what the, uh, what's the uh, Catholic order that said, give me a kid. Jesuit. 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 Jesuits, right. Give me a kid till he's seven and I'll have him trained for the rest of his life. Exactly, right. So most of us get the virus when we're, when we're young. But if we don't, or if we lose our religion, we usually regain it when we're under stress. Now, shingles. Where does shingles come from? No? Uh, chicken pox, right. Shingles come from chicken pox. So you have the chicken pox when you're a kid. The, the virus only goes into kind of seclusion and hiding. And later, when you're under a lot of stress, the virus re, uh, comes back out and causes shingles. So the virus is in hiding and it comes out and it can go back and forth. You see the same thing in people. How many times have you seen people who didn't seem very religious at all and one day their mother dies or, their, or, or they get a, a, an illness, a serious illness or their husband gets in a major car accident and within weeks they're major big into religion again. God saved my husband from the wreck or God saved me from cancer. You've seen that, haven't you? Stress is when people re-get religion. It comes back. It comes back with a vengeance just like the shingles virus, the, the uh, chicken pox virus does. Conversion syndromes. You remember St. Paul, don't you? St. Paul. Where did he get converted? On the road to Damascus. You're right. So, on the road to Damascus, Paul at that particular time was under a lot of stress. He was out killing people and tying them up, you know. It, it, it's a lot of stress to do that. What we do know is when people are under a lot of stress, things can happen that are unpredictable. In fact, the Chinese and the Koreans figured this out when they brainwashed people into making confessions during the Korean War. The Soviets did it as well. There's a lot of research on how this works. People's brains can literally flip from one orientation to another orientation when under stress. And that's when you see stress religious conversions. We see that quite a bit. You're most susceptible to illness when you're under stress, right? That's when you get the cold. That's when you get other diseases when your immune system is suppressed because of stress. 
Same thing with religion. People get religion when they're under a lot of stress. They don't generally get religion when things are going well. See the similarities here. They're all over the place between these two groups. Well, there's conversion syndrome. What are the behaviors of people who get converted? Do you notice they, they start spouting up all sorts of stuff and they stop talking to some people because they're not religious. You don't believe in Jesus, so I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Or if I do talk to you, it's because I'm going to try and make you believe the same thing I do. There's a whole panoply of behaviors that change when somebody gets converted to religion. The virus gets inside the mind and literally changes the way that person perceives the world in dramatic, dramatic ways. So when someone gets converted, I ask a couple questions. I say, when did it occur? Was it after a death or an illness in the family? Uh, what was their childhood training? You may have noticed when people get reconverted, they usually convert back to the religion they were trained in as a child. Christians, when they grow up and get under stress, don't suddenly, oh, Allah is the answer. They don't do that, do they? Uh -uh. They don't, Generally, they stick with whatever the religion they were when they were trained as a young child. And that's interesting. They don't just spontaneously get other religions. How was the infection facilitated? Who helped infect that person? Um, was it a youth minister? Was it a preacher? Was it a priest? A lot of times the techniques that they use are, well, I could explore that at some length, but I won't this evening, are facilitate the infection a lot more. Anybody been to church camp in here? Subjected to that? All right, good. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Church camp is like a uh, cesspool of infectious viruses. <laughs> and everybody's trying to infect you. And if you try to resist, man, it's like they swarm on you. Everybody's, you're going to believe in Jesus whether you like it or not before you leave this church camp. Because the whole purpose of church camp is to totally infect people so they go back and do the work of, you know, whatever God that they're supposed to be doing the work of. Uh, so, as we talked about, major stress in life, death of a loved one, serious threatening life health. Those are oftentimes the most common reasons why people convert to religion or reconvert back into religion. So now we're going to talk about infection channels. I've kind of given you a broad overview, and we're going to look at channels. There are major infection channels, one of which is hypnosis. Hypnosis is used in almost every religion that I've ever studied. It uses cadence and rhythmic values in the voice so that you begin to feel very relaxed and you might become more susceptible to hypnotic suggestion after the sermon is over. Are you feeling more relaxed? <laughs> it's a pretty simple technique. It also, you'll, you'll notice if you just go on TV and watch some of these televangelists, they're great hypnotists. They really are. They're doing all sorts of stuff there. Hypnosis is one. Stress is another we talked about. Uh, another area is guilt. Guilt is a really good one. And we'll, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about guilt later. Social needs. People go to church to get their social needs met. That's why they're there. And so, but the problem is when you go to church, then you got to believe all this craziness. You can't just get your social needs met. You got to believe in the Virgin Mary too. You know, or you got to be dumped. You know, there's all sorts of things that have to happen as a result of that. Sex. Sex is another one that's used for infection. I'll come back and talk about that in good gory detail later. It's a lot more fun to talk about sex. Music. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about music as well. Music is a great infection technique because it is so hypnotic. And there's actually physiological evidence now for how music coordinates brain waves among a wide range of people. So that now you can infect entire organizations called congregations. And the last, it, not that this is a comprehensive list, of course, is childhood intimidation, which most of us experience. When you put all of this together, here's what you get. <laughs> All right, so those are the major channels of infection. I'm sorry, I will apologize if there's any Republicans in here, but 
What did I just do? I screwed up. Oh, Sarah, Sarah's getting back at me. That's the problem. <laughs> well, she has a person with this stuff. So that's <laughs> All right. So I, I went somewhere else for that. All right. So the hypnosis channel. We'll spend a, a, a few minutes on hypnosis. A hypnosis is a is the purpose of this technique is to create a quasi meditative state and relaxation response so that we can pair guilt with the message. So as long as I can get you feeling about, you know, you were saved by Jesus and your sins are what put him on the cross. So I'm pairing a nice, relaxing, or it may not be relaxing, it may be exciting. I mean, you can do it either way, but it's still hypnotic. And then you bring in the guilt message. Guilt is a key component that's delivered through the hypnotic technique. It opens the host to potential infection with God virus ideas. Now remember, a biological virus has to get inside of you and has to find the key to open the cell and go inside to propagate. If it can't find the key, then you're not going to get infected. There's 200 rhinoviruses. You probably couldn't get 160 of them. I mean, your body's already immune to a lot of them. So you have to find the rhino. The rhinovirus has to find the person they've got the key to. And religions are a lot like that, too. You ever ask the question, why did he get Jehovah's Witness? Why didn't he get Mormonism? Why didn't he catch that? He's more susceptible to one particular infection strategy than another infection strategy. So hypnosis is achieved with sermon techniques, with praying techniques. Preachers are great at using hypnosis during prayer. If anybody's gone through one of those pastoral prayers, they pray in, in church, whoa. You can